Should we should I start? Or should we wait a few more minutes? Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Simon's telling me that I should start. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you ask everybody else on yet. Yeah. Are you happy to start? I guess there's a couple more people who said they were coming, but we're not so sure they will come. We take the emails off. Oh, I've got to take the emails off too. I'll let people in if it's out. <laughs> Sort of renovated about how long ago was it? Christine was like three or four years ago um, to make it a sort of home as a showroom and a design studio. And underneath here we have our, our stock room as well. And um, I quickly, can I your name? Alex. Alex was just asking me how I got into this. So I'll, I'll quickly tell you it's quite a, a nice story. Um, I trained as a graphic designer initially and did a degree in graphic design. And I had a uh, business as um, uh, graphic designer for many years, doing logos, brochures, packaging, that sort of thing. And uh, then I uh, got into books. I'll just show you how it's very silly books. I had <laughs> ideas. A friend of mine said to me, uh, what should I do for a hen night? Because I'm getting married and I can surely there's a book on it. And there wasn't, so I created a book, <laughs> which is a sort of the sort of thing you read on the toilet, really, <laughs> with like illustrations and little ideas, fun little things. And I got into these books. This is another one from many years ago, the A to Z of Surviving the Millennium. Um, fun things, because I quite liked the idea of having a sort of physical product, whereas when you're a graphic designer, you're helping other people with their own products and services, promoting them, doing the packaging, the logos, brochures, and all that sort of thing. And then I moved from there. I, I got frustrated with this because we created these books. I worked with a, a writer to put them together and we sold them to the publishing houses and then they printed them and distributed them. But we found that uh, we were sort of at their mercy because they put us on national television to launch this. And then we found that the books hadn't even arrived in bookshops because they hadn't got their distribution sorted out. So we did, you know, made our best efforts on our product here, but they had let us down. So I'm a bit of a control freak. So I, I wanted to have something that I'm completely in control of. So from there, I moved into being a photographer for some, at the advent of digital photography and bought a very big printer, which was about a meter wide and took 22 meter rolls of canvas or um, art paper. And I started a photography business and with my photographs, making big canvases um, and so forth, and doing a lot of portraits. And then after that, I, whilst I was doing that, I went horse riding and I fell off a horse and I broke my back and I broke my wrist in six places and stuck in hospital for a few months. And at the same time, a friend of mine who has a, a furniture shop asked um, 40 people in the art world to design a rug to celebrate their 40th year of being in business. So I uh, was asked to design a rug as one of the 40. I had no idea how to do it. I didn't really know anything about tech help at all. Uh, but I liked working with color and graphic shapes. So, and it was, there was, it was just a fun project really. And uh, everybody got a rug from their own home and they were going to put a rug in their shop and people could order them if they wanted to. So this rug, I designed it, I kept fiddling around with it. 
couldn't find a way to make it work. And eventually I got fed up and I just said, I'm going to bring you my graphic design. I had no graphic design. And on the day of the, the meeting, I still hadn't got the rug design. And it was only until about an hour before the meeting. I got the rug design, I thought it was okay. And I arrived there about 15 minutes late because I was still fiddling around. With it. <laughs> gave him the rug design. And then about a year later, all these 40 rugs for the um, exhibition had been made. And to my surprise, this one I had designed was uh, picked up by a lot of magazines and newspapers as you know, a highlight, one of the highlights of the exhibition, and then was uh, awarded a, a, um, a prize from El Decoration magazine. And through all that publicity, people started asking me, would I design a rug for them? So I started thinking this is actually quite an interesting business, um, particularly because uh, with rugs, you don't really need to necessarily make a large volume. At least this business that I've created here is not a volume business. So it's all about creating something really beautiful. We do have our own collection of around 40 rugs and they're available in different sizes, but we also uh, do bespoke rugs for big projects and we can adapt some of the rugs, colors or shapes, proportions to, to work with different um, situations. So, um, and also at the time when I started this business, which was in earnest was really in 2011. So, uh, it's about 10 years ago. It was really at the, sort of the beginning of the internet age. And um, to start off with, I just was running from my spare room at home and keeping a few rugs in my garage. And um, people from, you know, I set up a website and you know, the day after I had an e-commerce sort of um, added to the website, I started selling rugs all over the world. And in those days, you didn't really have to do any publicity or, you know, the internet was uh, wasn't as it is now, which is far more competitive. But uh, people just started buying them from all around the world. And I exhibited um, in 2011 at the London Design Festival. So before that, I was sort of trying to find some movers and working out how to do things a bit. But when we exhibited in um, the London Design Festival, they... I had a little website and we were getting about 200 visitors a month. And I was just desperately trying to work out how to get to 300. <laughs> and then with the, being part of London Design Festival, the um, uh, publicity machine around the, uh, the show that I decided to exhibit in, have a little stand, took some of the images of the rugs. And suddenly we found that they were on the front cover of magazines and they were picked up by a lot of, uh, there's something called design milk. I don't know if you've seen design milk. I didn't know what design milk was, but they, at that time, they were already getting about 10 million uh, visitors a month. And uh, suddenly one day we had um, 450,000 people coming to our website on one day. So, it sort of went a bit viral, and through that, I was lucky enough to be able to start a business because people started saying, Can I buy? You know, I didn't really have any stock. Can I buy one? And, you know, I sold one, and then with that, I made a few more, and then I sold a few more, and then, you know, organically develop uh, this business. So, uh, and, and here we are today. So, what I wanted to, to tell all you guys, because you're studying uh, interior design. Is it about rugs and how you can use them in your projects, how uh, useful they can be in a, in a design sense, and um, how, how to specify them, and a bit about how they're made, and uh, what goes into the whole process of a rug, uh, which is something I had never considered, and I never really had any interest or took any notice of rugs, until that first one that I had made as part of this um, exhibition because when I got the rug that I had designed and put it in my home, it totally transformed the room. And that sort of got me thinking, you know, how nice is this and how interesting it is. And I think a rug is one of the biggest things you can add to a room in terms of, you know, covering space. If you put a duvet cover from a, from a like a large size bed, that also has a a big effect because it's you know color but a rug has got texture and it can soak up sound um and it's um can be sculptured and have different color heights you can work with the shape 
for me, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, medium to work in. Um, and I find it quite exciting. And it, it also what's very exciting is you design something on a piece of paper like this and you suddenly see it's a huge rug. It takes on another sort of quality from you know a design into the product. And the, all our rugs are made by hand. So the weavers who um, take the design and specification, they put their own level of their own mastery of you know weaving and quality and understanding and interpretation of your design into it. So it's not only one person's design, it's a lot of other things go into, you know, even just choosing the yarn, not just saying it's going to be New Zealand wool, it's the quality of the New Zealand wool, the way it's been spun, the way it's been done, the way it's been twisted, uh, the tuck tight, the density of the weaving, all these things add to the quality of you know, feeling something's really beautiful and textural and lovely, um, but something quite ordinary. And I think you get that a lot in craft generally, you know, if you look at, you take a cup from Ikea, which, you know, I've got nothing against Ikea, or in a, a hand thrown mug by a um, potter, which has all the texture and irregularity of something being made by hand, it's totally different. And it makes you feel totally different, to be honest. You know, you pick up uh, a cup and um, it's really beautiful, but I want to show you because I've got an example of this, which I love which is, you know, just to pass around. This is, I'll show you, just so you really feel it. This is an Ikea one. To pass them around. That's an Ikea one. This is one handmade by a potter. And it's handmade by other potters, lovely drips and textures and whatever. And the irregularity, you know, and the, the quality of something being handmade, to me, is very, very special. And uh, it's why, it's, you know, you can, you can sort of feel the difference of something that's made sort of mechanically and something that's made by hand. So anyway, I'm going to tell you more about So, but as I said, please do interrupt me and ask me any questions as we go along. Oh, just a good question. Yeah. When you're designing yeah. a rug, and yeah. obviously, like the materials you're making them out of can yeah. make the rugs look really differently. Yeah. Would you design your rug and then choose the material, or know the material you're going to work with and then design based on that? Yeah, good question. Every material has its own sort of idiosyncrasies and ways of achieving the way you want it to be. And so, over these years of um, working with rugs, We've tried out a few different things, and um, I decided to stick with a very narrow range of materials because I know exactly how they work and how they react. And because also all these materials that we work with are natural materials, you know, wool and silk. Um, every every um, hank of wool, every if I have lots of wool, even if it's a New Zealand wool can be different to the next because it's organic product. So there's always levels of variation in everything. So to keep a kind of consistent quality running through things, I've chosen to limit the type of uh, yarn we use and the type of weaving we use, because there's different types of weaving which I'll come on to. So there are loads of different things, but I'd rather be an expert in a few, you know, not, uh, you know, and master them than try and offer a very large range. Yeah, yeah, uh, but they're so, yeah, the answer to your question is that I work in a small palette of materials and weaving, but my experimental side is really using color, shape, and pattern, form. Um, and that's where the sort of experimental side comes in. But I know that because, for example, the yarn that we use. In New Zealand wool is twisted in a particular way that's kind of unique to us to reflect colour and achieve vibrant colour. Um, and that's come through experimenting, 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 different ways of doing things to get it that way. And when you're designing a new rug, you can't, you can't really go through sort of six months of experimenting with the yarn twisting. You know, we've worked out what gives us the result we want. And we just we stick with those variables really. And change the variables of the sort of the design palette, so to speak. Cool. Thank you. So anyway, this is some of 
in designing, you can see I've got a design box of different tools, pens, nail varnishes, paints, light boxes, collages, whatever. You, know, you can have a lot of fun doing di different things. So, so what can rugs add to your design scheme? So the, these are different aspects of what the rug can bring you to um, your design scheme. It, a rug can create a zone. So if you, a lot of people are working with open plan, big spaces these days, sort of warehousey or taking down walls and you know opening up off the big ground floor open space. And you need to zone, otherwise everything's just uh, doesn't feel cozy to be honest. You know, without some kind of zoning, uh, it brings color, interest, and texture to neutral design uh, spaces. And it can bring together the elements. So um, if you've got uh, cushions, uh, vases, chairs, whatever, you can bring in all the colors that you're using in your color palette and bring it into a rug and it sort of holds it all together. Uh, and that sort of uh, covers matching up colors and design things. But it also improves acoustics, especially the ones that uh, we have, because we make their tactic very densely, so you've got a lot of fibre, and they're a lot thicker than the average type of rug. So the more um, fibre you have, the more it absorbs sound and is good for acoustics. And a lot of modern interiors, all the fibre has been stripped out. People like wood, concrete, uh, porcelain floors. A lot of people are using shutters or Roman blinds rather than um, curtains. Um, and a lot of people use leather rather than, you know, thick fabrics. So suddenly you have like an amazing, very modern interior, but it can be quite stark and not very welcoming in uh, home life to actually live in. It looks fantastic. And it can also often very, very echoey because, you know, there's nothing to absorb the sound because you've got too many hard surfaces. Um, so that covers that. But this just is a little example of a room with uh, the same room, slightly different angle, but, you know, with a rug and without a rug. And the difference it can make. Uh, and these are examples of the zoning. So you can imagine this this room on the left with no rug. And the zone like that, you've got sort of music area, sort of secondary area, and the main seating area. There you've got the dining and living. Um, with the highlighting small cozy corners, different areas here. That's just a landing, but it suddenly becomes a more interesting space where you want to sit and work. And adding uh, color and texture, making a focal point. You can imagine all these rooms without a rug would be quite um, uninviting. Uh, this is an example of bringing together the elements of the room. You can see we've got the teal um, furniture and the teal rug. This one's actually a, 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 a beach house we did the rug for in Mexico. It was like a six meter rug, very, very big. But all the elements, you know, the orange sofas and blue cushions, artwork, all, the, all sort of comes into the design of the rug. Uh, mirroring design themes in the, the room. This one on the left was designed to echo what was happening in the ceiling, the, the circle and the square. So the rug is the circle and the square. And the colours, the middle ones, bringing in the, the nature into the room, and then echoing design themes. Uh, mm. to the right there. So one of the questions we get asked a lot uh, by our customers is, you know, how uh, to choose, what size to choose for your rug. So there's sort of three main ways of doing this is have all your furniture on the rug or have the rug half on and half off or have it all off. And I'll show you examples. And that's creative for a living room. For a bedroom, you can use runners and um, dining areas. You have to be quite careful because you don't really want a rug, um, a rug underneath a uh, dining table is a very good idea because it soaks up the sound. And the dining, you know, when you're eating, you usually want to be in conversation with people. And if you've got a big echoey room and very little fiber, it's not a good place to have a conversation. But whether you, when you choose a rug for a dining area, you want to make sure that when you pull your chair back, you're not half 
on the rug and half off the rug because that's destabilizing. You suddenly find that you know you might fall off your chair or you know feel a bit wonky. So these are all things to consider. So just examples of this. This is in a living room, all all furniture on the rug. You can see that in the floor plan and it's examples of it. And then this is the half on half off scenario, which also can look really lovely. You can see the furniture all here, you know, the front legs are on the sofa and the back legs are off. And that's okay when you've got heavy furniture, but it's not so good for dining chairs, which are far lighter. Um, and then this is all off. So when you've got a smaller space uh, and a smaller budget, because obviously the rug, the cost of a rug is uh, dependent on the size. So our, all our rugs are priced up according to their square meters. So you could, with our ones, we specialize in doing strange shapes. So it's quite nice to see the outline of the shape rather than having it all hidden underneath the furniture. So you can go with a smaller rug if you, if you wish. It, looks, it still looks nice. Uh, for a bedroom, one of the challenges of the bedroom is that if you put a rug underneath the bed, oh, we put that there so you can see the screen deck, but it's, <laughs> it's temporary as you can see. <laughs> Um, so yeah, with a, it might be, I think it'll be okay. Yeah, just leave it. It may just last the presentation. Yeah. So um, now one of one of the challenges. It's not. It's very nice to have a, a rug in a bedroom and you get out of bed and you've got hard surfaces. It's lovely to step out of bed and put you know your bare feet on a rug. Um, there's, having a runner on each side is a very good solution so, and it's quite fun to do same but different you see in the bottom it's the same design different colorway uh, or if the budget allows you can have you know a big rug uh, but we had a, a client here earlier this week who's in a beautiful uh, big flat and many flats don't allow you to have wooden floors so what they've done to get around that, they've actually laid wood all the way around the edge of the rooms. And then they've got rugs inset into it. So it looks like it's a rug on the floor, which are not really allowed, but in fact, it's a rug that's been used as a carpet and it just has this border all the way around, which is something like the far left one really, because it's the majority of the room. You've got your bedside tables, your uh, bed, all on the rug but you have a small area around. And quite a lot of people actually put rugs on carpet as well. If you've just got a very neutral carpet, you know, uh, a beige or brown, and it's, it's a bit deadening to the room. A lot of our customers just buy a rug and they stick it on top of the carpet, which is a surprising shibby to me, but it does, it does look very nice. Uh, so this is the dining room situation. So you can see at the top there, we have a chair move a chair back on both of those floor plans to see that you want to be able to move your chair back and still it still remains on the rug. Now the one in the middle actually was uh, from a TV program that they borrowed our rug from the ugly, what's it called? The lovely house. house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they they chose the wrong size rugs you can see because if you see the chairs you move them back they're going to be off the, half off the rug. So there you go. Um, hallways, different ideas. This one is actually surprisingly effective. You've got the same design in a hallway repeated. Things in twos and threes can look very, very nice together. Um, and with uh, these sort of designs, this lady's kept them sort of exactly the same orientation but you can turn them 90 degrees or 180 degrees and they look really different um okay so these are some of the things by the way we, we're going to we collected all your details and we will send you this presentation so you can refer to it if you um but things to consider when you're uh commissioning a rug um so if you've already got a design you know, it's not necessary to change your existing design. You could take a rug that's uh, designed that exists and 
adjust the colors, change the colors to work. If you like the design, but you want different colorways, that, that can be done with us. Quite a few other people will do that if they're working in you know, small bodies like uh, we are. Um, also, to, to take note, to be, to be uh, mindful of is how the colors work together. Because a lot of designers we work with will come and just sort of say, well, I want this color, this color, this color. But when you actually visualize it, they're quite shocked because you know if you say, I want uh, a lot of bright, you know, bright red, and they, they think they want it throughout the room, or throughout the rug. When you actually see it, you can see it on a piece of paper, but if you see it as a huge rug, it's quite uh, startling how you know the effect of color. And it's uh, we've had a few times when I've said to people, Are you sure you really want all that red? Yes, 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 yes. When the rug gets made, they're like, oh my God. <laughs> um, so um, often, you know, I think everybody has their speciality. And I think that's the interesting thing with inter interior design. You're dealing with lots of different specialities. I mean, furniture makers, lighting, flooring, rugs, curtains, whatever. I think it's always good to really take professional advice. And go with the advice because the people who are doing your curtains, they're doing curtains, you know, maybe for 10 years, they know what's going to uh, work for you. Um, and, you know, I, I, over the years, you know, you get an, uh, a feel for what, what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, yes, almost anything's possible, but this can be a problem. Yeah, and that's something I, I, would, I would not show clients really. You know, if you give people too much choice, then they, they get uh, paralyzed <laughs> by choice. So you, you sort of have to narrow down what you want and just kind of be quite specific. Uh, it's, it's great. Quite a few of our customers start with a rug and they just say, I love this rug. It really speaks to me. And then I'm going to choose the colors for the rest of the room from that, which is uh, very easy for us, really. But um, yeah, and then I always like to say to people, don't be afraid of color. Because a lot of people use kind of cookie cutter uh, design schemes of you know beige and grey and maybe a hint of one or two other colours, and uh, colour is literally will transform a scheme totally. And, and colour actually has been physically proven to change uh, how how you feel. You know they put people into uh, a small room and painted it red and measured their body, you know, their, their temperature, their heart rate, etc. And they've done the same thing, put them in a, a green room, put them in a yellow room, put them in a pink room. And they will actually have a physical effect on your being. So you can use colour to make you feel excited, to make you feel calm, you know, to evoke different feelings. I remember many years ago, I went to someone's home and they made this amazing pink room. And if you think of pink room, you probably think, yuck but it was so beautiful um and you know different shades and um gentle shades you know and it was uh color can completely you know that room I, I remember it from 20 years ago and it's still i have a certain feeling i think about it so that color does that for you so here's an example of um using um Colour to bring things together. So on the left, we see our cheap sunset bar, and that's we did a project with an interior designer who had this wallpaper, which has a very textural, it had some sort of embroidery in it. And we, we the job was to pick out some of the colours in the wallpaper and put it in the rug, which which we did there in the bottom right. We never really got a very good, they did send us a picture of the rug, but it didn't really sh show it very well. So that's why we just didn't like this. We always like nice pictures afterwards. This is another one of our bubbles rug, which you can see in the middle. That was a, an adaptation, adaptation of our bubbles rug to fit in a room. But they wanted to, us to match the colours of the fabrics in the furniture. And that's to the left, you see how we did that. And they wanted this sort of beigey colour, which was, you see in the sofas there. So. And there's the rug with the furniture all finished. Uh, this is another one where we matched fabrics. We took a existing design, adapted it using the fabrics and uh, paint colors, 
and incorporated it into some very big rugs. So you can see initially they wanted a, a huge one. You can see the dining table, sofa, little sort of and the card table sort of thing there. So that was going to be absolutely huge. And then in the end, they went for the one on the right, so a smaller baby rug there. That's easier to work with. And if you move house, they're likely to be able to fit the one on the left in any other home or any other room. Circular room, very difficult. Um, so uh, when you're specifying a room, like a rug, obviously you've got to decide what size you're going to choose. And looking at the options, whether furniture is going to be on it, half on it, um, off it, so forth. And then regarding colour, we work with uh, a couple of colour systems. One is called Chromatone, which we use most of all, which just to show you is um, these are some some chromatone ponds, which are the ponds of the uh, dyed wool. It's just an example of some blues. So these are uh, this color system is created using New Zealand's wool, which is a very white starting point, uh, which means you get bright colors. So and this is uh, a British system, whereas this is a, an Indian system, and the colours aren't quite as bright. If you look at you know these colours, for example, which are the similar ones, because they're dyed with uh, on Indian wool, and uh, the Indian wool hasn't had all the oil stripped out of the lanolin. Therefore, when you dye it, you're never going to get these bright colours. So this is what a lot of most people use this system because it's less expensive, but you can't get most of the colors that I'm looking for in it. So when we use these, our weavers can't afford these. So we send them in duplicates because this system has got about 4,000 colors in it and they bring out new colors all the time. So they can't afford to keep them. So we just send them the selection of the colors we're using in the design. And they, um, especially, you know, where they're woven, it's very hot and sunny and the cut these degrade as well. So we have to keep sending them again to them because they, the light degrades them, they get dirty and you can't match properly to them. Then you've got uh, the yarn type, which you, we were talking about at the beginning. There's loads of different yarns. Um, New Zealand's wool is what we use a lot of, and silk. There's Indian wool, which we touched on, um, of the, the that ARS system, which is dyed on Indian wool. Tibetan wool is a, another form of uh, kind of a local wool. Uh, companies like, for example, the rug company, they use a lot of Tibetan wool, which is actually, um, it, it's the local wool, so it's not an expensive wool. And it, it's very nice, but it doesn't give you the bright colors. It's a, it has a different kind of look. And you know, that's there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing better about one or the other, it's just a different uh result you get. Then you've got silk, art silk, bamboo silk, and various other things like uh cashmere, mohair, etc. So, I just wanted to show you in terms of uh having some different, these are this is uh, yeah. Uh, weaving types. So there's two types of weaving types that we work with mainly, which is tufting and knotting. So this is a, a New Zealand wool tufted rug. You can tell a tufted rug because it has a kind of backing on, on the back. Now a knotted rug is made uh, every knot by hand and you will see the back of a knotted rug will always look like this. So the quality of the knotted rug will depend on how many knots there are in an inch or a centimeter, how you choose to measure it. So the more knots, the, the finer the quality. Um, this is a viscose, which is artificial. Uh, people call it art silk. And um, if you compare silk to art silk, I'm not a, a big fan of art silk. Um, but as a uh, less expensive, I don't like to say, I can't see where I are. 
Uh, oh yeah, I don't like to say cheaper, but uh, less expensive option. If you have a design like something like this, has got uh, um, I'm trying to look at how many knots it is. I think that this is uh, eighty knots. So a hundred knots is what we like to use generally as the standard because it's uh, a it's a tight weave. And it translates designs very well. However, we have a very large draft. You can go down to 80 or 60 knots. It's not as good quality because it's not as tightly woven, uh, but it reduces cost and it depends on what budget you're working for. On. Uh, but here you've got this is bamboo silk, which is an alternative to uh, viscose, uh, which are both alternatives to silk. So the, the bamboo and the viscose cost about the same amount as New Zealand wool. But it, you get the silky feel in it. Um, but the downside of viscose and bamboo silk is that they haven't, they haven't been around that long. They don't wear as well. Uh, people don't know how long they're going to really wear in 25 years because they haven't been used in rugs for 25 years. They don't clean as well. And they, they're very absorbent because they're made out of wood fiber. And the wood fiber um, soaks up fluid so it's difficult to clean because the fluid sort of stays in the fiber um, but it's a alternative to paint the silk but if you want to pass each other I put some there as well you've got three uh samples there of sparkle <laughs> she wants to have a sit up there with you she's very naughty <laughs> If you've got any food in your bag, I'd just be aware because you'll be in there. Um, but if you want to take those there on the saw, but on that cloth thing, there's three uh, samples of the same design in, two, in three different, but uh, once knotted, silk knotted. <laughs> Do you mind, dog? No, no, no. Oh, I'll tell her to go away. Um, so but you, you can have a feel. So that's knotted because it has no backing. And the, also, the, the interesting thing about uh, yeah, have a look. Um, knotted rugs is that they're very flexible, as you can see when you're, you're feeling them. So if you have a very big rug, and we, we get to do some huge ones, um, transporting a very big rug can be problematic. So um, aeroplanes have limits on to how long a rug can be. And if you have a tufted rug, what happens often in the Middle East, if you are doing like a huge project for a palace or something, you create the rug and then you actually cut it into pieces. And then it gets shipped by air or by sea into the final home. And then you send specialists who come and stitch it all together again. Whereas with these knotted rugs, they're very flexible and they can actually be folded. So, um, you fold them in on themselves and they can go into like a cube type pallet and then they can be shipped far more easily. But one of the things when you're specifying rugs for big projects, very important to because a lot of people who are doing rugs will just, you know, if you've got a very big project, they'll say, great, you know, I'll take your money, we'll get the rug made. But can you get it into the uh, location you it's going into? We're doing one now for an apartment, a big one in Florida, and they only don't have a service elevator. They've only got the normal elevator. So before we make this rug, we've asked, you know, what is the dimension of the elevator? What weight can it take? Because we can calculate, depending on the weaving style, how much the, the rug is going to weigh, what we can fold it into. Because you don't want to find that you've got um, made a beautiful rug and you can't get it into the home which is a real possibility that, you know, that can happen. Um, so we covered the weaving types, the finishing. So you'll see uh, the rugs we have have been carved. You can see the sort of lines running through them and they're, they're all carved by scissors by hand. And there's, even that is specified in a particular way because traditionally the carving was always at 45 degrees. I don't really like that. I like it like at 90 degrees. So all these details are specified in, when you make the rug. Um, and even um, the binding, you know, traditionally rugs had fringes on the edge. People do quite fun things with fringes. You can 
dye them neon green and pink or you know have a batik effect in them whatever you could you know that's all part of the palette that you can do be playful with um and the top types you can see the rugs here behind you there they've got different levels because they're designed based on colors overlapping with each other because i designed those from collages of tissue papers with light going through them so you can see how the colors actually mix so for me one of my passions is how color works and i like to work with collage and have light coming through the collage and seeing how the colors mix to create something that looks like it's got light coming through it so then it feels lights up the room this one that you'll you have there is called kaleidoscope and it, it's based on the same thing you've got a video of that i think it's on our instagram of you know how the light was going through these colors and you move the colors around to get a nice arrangement provenance uh everybody's uh, very aware of uh the ethics these days which is really a great thing and we make sure that there's no child labor involved in our uh, rugs and we are a uh, member of Good Week. There's various other similar charities like Care and Share or uh, various um, certifications to make sure that um, all the weavers get a, a, a fair wage and uh, uh, adults, you know, children are doing these jobs. Uh, light fastness is something to bear in mind when you specify a rug. Um, our dyes are Swiss Azo free dyes. Uh, which means that they, they're they good for allergies, but they also um, don't fade that much. Everything fades. So if you have a wooden floor and it's in direct uh, south facing sunlight, you'll find that underneath the furniture, it stays dark and around where light gets to it, the wooden floor will lighten up. Um, color fastness is measured uh, one to five. Our rugs are considered about four because nothing is fine. But um, if you, a lot of rugs, say Moroccan rugs, for example, are used, uh, are made using natural dyes and they will fade because they're, you know, they're natural and, but the, the faded rug, it also has a quality of its own, which a lot of people like. It's just, you know, what, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, and then protection is something you can think about when you're specifying a rug. Some people don't like to bring any chemicals into their home, but Scotch guarding is the old fashioned way of you know, spraying onto a rug which you um, repeat for every year. And so stains or spills tend not to sink into the fibers. There's a new uh, um, technique that's called micro seal that's uh, been just available for the last couple of years. It had been used prior to launching the domestic product, uh, it had been used in aviation. So most of the fabrics you see in aeroplanes will be treated by microseal, so that when they claim that it uh, any spill just remains on the surface as a droplet, it doesn't fall into and get absorbed by the fibers, which is very good for um, commercial situations. They say it's a natural product, but it's a kind of secret formula like Coca Cola. <laughs> They're not really allowed to know what's actually in it. So. Um, but they told me that it, it's based on lanolin, which is interesting because lanolin is the natural uh, oil that's in uh, wool. And so the New Zealand wool has quite a lot of the lanolin taken out to get that nice white starting point. And the Tibetan wool and the um, Indian wool keeps, they don't, um, well, it, it's a costing as well. They don't want to spend money getting rid of the lanolin. But it does give you a kind of uh, oily texture to the wool, which is also repellent to, um, you know, to spill and that sort of thing. So I have a feeling what they do is like adding a lot of that into the onto the fiber in some kind of spray form, which helps uh, repel uh, stains. Anyway, so we've just been through all this actually, all the different yarns, and also the different types of uh, the tufting, the hand tufting and the hand knotting, the different 60 knots, 80 knots, 100 knots, you can do more than 100 knots, you can do 200 knots and it takes ages to weave because you know when you're doing 100 knots you, you tend to weave about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters a day. So when you have the weavers doing this by um, hand will weave to the width of their shoulders so and that tends to be a meter. 
So if you've got a four metre rug, you'll have four people sitting side by side weaving. And they're all chosen to work together because they've got the same tautness in their weaving, because otherwise you get a line going up the middle. And so, you know, everybody's weaving. It's a you know, very intricate process that's been around for over 2,000 years. Um, <coughs> and there's other types of weaving apart. I've put on here digital tufting. So the tufting, I think we've got some pictures here. Uh, hold on. I think there's going to be some pictures I'll show you shortly. But there's the tufting is done using a hand tool. But you can't, there are in Turkey people are doing digital tufting. And so, uh, you know, it's like a digital plotter. It's all um, uh, set up with uh, yarns. You press a button, it goes, mm, and it, it starts weaving your rug. But for me, I really can tell the difference when it's not made by hand. I don't like it. But it's, you know, it's a less expensive, not cheaper way of doing things because, you know, humans aren't involved as much. Uh, oh, yeah. And some of the, these are some examples. As well as other, there's something that's uh, called loom knotted, um, which is um, works for very big pieces where you have a kind of a machine that you sort of pull like this and it, it weaves like um, it's a kind of mechanical, but hand, hand controlled, so to speak, way of weaving. Um, and also, I just want to show you this is quite interesting as well. This is something we use a bit, which shows you different thicknesses. When you're choosing, when you're specifying the rug, you can pass that around. It shows you the, a thin uh, weaving going all the way up to really, really thick. So that's part of what you can specify. And here as well, if you can pass this on and have a look at, there's two types of, um, this is knotted, you can tell from the back. This is a loop. And it gives you this kind of um, not so smooth texture. It's a rough texture, which is also very nice. And this is called cut because the loop has been cut. And so you can, if you feel it, see how different it is. Um, and the thicker you get, of course, the thicker you get, the less detail you'll get. But you've got a very intricate design, like the Persian ones, who used to be very, very thin because otherwise the fibers are moving around and they don't translate the design accurately because the fibers are moving. So you choose different thickness for different things. But the thicker it is, the more uh, sound it absorbs and the more sort of cozy feel you get. Um, okay, so this just shows some of the processes involved in making the rug. This is the dye master and he's using the Swiss dyes. Um, to, to weigh up, we weigh them on a weigh scale with little weights and to work out, it has a recipe book of how to make the different colours on the different yarns. So that's his, his recipe book. Basically. Now here, now, Becca, how do I show me how to go to the little video? Let's see, so that's, yeah, oh, yeah, great. So this, this is an example of how the yarn is dyed. It's all done in rural communities. It's called pot time because it's just in a pot. And they weigh up the amount of yarn. We're not, we give them a design. Uh, they'll then calculate how much yarn, how many kilos of yarn they need of each color. And then the, the, the dyes are all uh, weighed out. And then they'll, um, they'll dye it like this. Uh, and it, it's, been, uh, it's in hot water, so the dye fixes. So these, the, these, even though it's in very rural communities, it's, you know, the skills they have are incredible. So you know, if I say to them, I want this colour, they can dye it, you know, it won't be that colour, it won't be that colour, it will be this colour. And, you know, they weigh it up, but they're doing it by eye and experience. And I mean, it is amazing, you know, because you can't see what the, the yarn is like until it's, it's dried. Uh, but you know they're, they're pretty accurate. But having said that, we kind of like to control everything. These are mainly made in India. Some of them are made in Nepal, but that the skills are really there in India. Um, okay, we're back on to. Oh, Becca, help me. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm on my next video. Next video. Yeah. 
Okay, so then this this shows uh, how the dyed yarn is then spun. So this is all very old-fashioned techniques. You know, all in rural communities, everything's done by hand. But how do you find people like this to work with? But well, we work with like people who uh, have a, a kind of leading company. So their job is to find the people with it. So they've got the people with different skills. So most of the rugs, and this is how it works with the different types of crafts in Antwerp, is that you know, most of the rugs are made in one region because everybody's concentrated there with those the skills that you need. So there's so many different skills in making the rug from, you know, people who, who are experts in purchasing yarn in the, you know, the wool market have to get certain quality, know how to do that, to dye, the dye masters, the people who know how to spin it, whatever. So they're all in the same community. So people say they have a kind of um, their own rug making business, but really what they they know, they have their community where they have that, they, these people work for them and do their rugs. They may be doing some, you know, some spinning for some other people, but they're all in the, they all know each other. They're all in the same community. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty complicated process to get it happening. So we work with people who organize all this and their you know their families have been in the industry for a few generations. Yeah, I can't remember where which which page am I on? So that just shows this says shows you what, what we're doing here for the next one. And then we go to the next page. Oh hold on, yeah. So this shows this actually is quite interesting. Don't go away, I've got to get to the next one, but this <laughs> That shows tufting. So that's the mark, the type of weaving where you have the canvas on the back. They use you see a hand tool there, and they load up the tool with the yarn and they weave it from the back. Now this is our after the tea slot being woven here. And you see each area has two uh, numbers. One is the colour and the other is the top type. So we're working quite in a sculpture way to have different top types. So they have to adjust their hand tool. Uh, have to load it up with the right color and then they adjust it according to the tough type. Um, the same uh, rug there is being made knotted. In fact, that thing you're seeing there is that that piece there see on the top. Yeah, that is it being made in pure silk that's for like a uh, architect client. You can see on the back that it's knotted, so you can see the, the knots that no. Uh, and they're doing every single knot by hand, so that takes them longer. And they work with a rod there, and the thickness of the rod depend, uh, it determines the power height. So, and you can see at the bottom, that's our deep sunset rug being woven for that big project in Mexico. And you see the cushions on the bottom. Each cushion is for a weaver. And as I said, they each weave to their shoulder width. So there were, uh, I think, six weavers there sitting along there making it. So then this, so I'll go to this one. Yep. Oh yeah, so this shows tufting. So this is uh, shows electrical tufting. So they, they either they either do it uh, electrically held by hand, or they use a hand tool, uh, mechanical. Uh, in India, they get a lot of power cuts. Sometimes you have like eight power cuts a day. When you've got a machine like that, it's very annoying. So often they prefer just to not have a electrical. So this shows this shows uh this one of our tree trunk rugs there. And so some of the processes involved in you know do the edges all by hand and all the work that, that goes into it. So, anyway, that, that just goes on in the same way. Just stop that one. Yeah, the presentation is So that, yeah, that shows that. Oh yeah, then they get they get washed after they come off. See that one on the left? That's one of our Echoes of Light rugs, which is actually a collaboration between the glass artists. You may have seen the glass pieces as we came in. Tim Warnington, who's an amazing uh, glass artist. And it has all the strings on the edge because it hasn't been finished yet, but it gets washed and then it gets dried 
that's uh, in Nepal on the uh, uh, rooftops in the Kathmandu Valley. They they all get put out to dry there before the binding time on the edges. Um, I think we've done that binding one. And then there's various different processes like getting the fluff out. We've got video, don't we? Why did they get washed? They get washed. Oh, this is a different one actually. That's a bit more. It's got some slipping. They uh, they get washed to uh, because they've been sort of handled a lot uh, when they're uh, been woven. The um, the tool for the tufting. Sometimes has oil on it. Look at to to oil it to make it run smoothly. You want to get the oil out of the rug. Sometimes you get bits of oil on there. And it also uh, by washing it, it brings out the colour as well. Um, so this is really good. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and then so when the rugs come into us, we go. That's Christina. <laughs> which is uh, quality controlling them. So they, they come here and uh, sometimes they go directly to their client. We have all the rugs photographed and we check them before they come to us, uh, the back and front and de you know, details. Every rug has to be photographed by our reading before we allow it to be shipped to us. And then uh, they, we do a, often do a final finishing ourselves and obviously they get labelled we make sure that we know every single rug, which when it was made, who it was made by. So every every rug is traceable. Um, Cara Mason, we talked about uh, Scotch Guard and Macra Seal, and we've got information about that if you ever want to have any of that. Oh, that's a typo on there, shedding, shedding, I should say. <laughs> um, so rugs, uh, particularly the tufted rugs, will shed a little bit, particularly when they're new. Um, so they need to be uh, vacuumed uh, a couple of times a week, initially for the first month or two. Uh, and then there's various ways of dealing with stains and the vinegar, salt, and uh, getting them clean professionally. Uh, just another example about ways you can use rugs, which is as wall hangings, which has been around for years. Because that's really sort of uh, the next step from using tapestry, which you know people were using the Bayer tapestry, uh, you know, for a, a very very long time. These are this is an example of in the Sydney Opera House. You may be familiar with that, uh, but the um, architect who uh, designed that room. I don't know if he's the architect of the Sydney Opera House. You may know that. I can't, I'm not sure. Isn't he a Danish architect? Yeah, you saw. Yeah, that's right. He, he was a. Yeah. He was, yeah. So he made this. He's made a huge sort of tapestry all along one wall. I should know how long it is, but I don't. But that's part of having that is for the acoustics. Um, and it's for a room. Uh, it says here. It adjusts the acoustics, adds color, texture, human scale, and symbolic meaning. But they're great as sort of uh, to put on the wall. And in the States, a lot of the people use, in the States, people love craft and they love um, quilting and pottery and, and they, they love textiles. And they, they do use that picture, the second one from the bottom, that was from, uh, actually, that was in South America, but the, and that's using. Um, Melting. But having a rug on the wall is, is, a, is a really lovely thing to do. Um, and it, it adds a lot more in some ways than a painting. So you've got the texture, it's like an acoustic panel. It's fine to touch it, you know, which you don't really want to go around touching people's paintings. It's uh, a relatively inexpensive way of showing a, a wall. Because if you were to get a painting this sort of size, you know, that could be, you know, 10 grand plus potentially, whereas you know, having a rug there is uh, less expensive. And you can hear you've got um, John Piper, a uh, wonderful artist, one of his work translated into uh, a tapestry. And Miro worked just, he was 
playing with te uh, textures and textiles uh, with his artworks. There's something about the uh, different uh, ethics, different uh, the good news logo to look out for the fair and share. And that, that's the end of the presentation. That's about an hour. So if you have any questions <laughs> about I just had one, you're talking yeah. about the colour passing and stuff yeah. like that and how you're always expecting to lose some sort of like, uh, you know, full effect of the die at the start. Yeah. If you knew you were going to be putting it into like a really sunny room that's going to have, yeah. you know, 10 hours, 12 hours or something yeah. like that, would you design differently and stuff like that? And then there's certain colours that just say that's not, that's going to be gone in six months or what would you do in that sort of situation? Well, if you, I'd be very careful about putting the rug in, say, a, um, conservatory which is self-facing mm -hmm. a lot of people now uh put film on the the glass which oh, is yeah. uh protects uh you from the uv mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually get glass now that's made with uv sort of filters in it okay. uh, and that mm -hmm. helps but uh anything that's due south will will fade okay. and you know if you if if you're doing a project with that, you know, you've got to be careful about wood because that will fade. Using, say, porcelain floor, that probably won't fade. But so a lot of porcelain, they also like digitally print on there, like they print wood effects or they print mm. marble effects and that sort of thing. So that essentially can fade as well. So uh, when you have sunlight just doing its normal thing, we often say to people, well, you know, do turn your rug, say, 180 degrees mm. every, every six months or something. And it's get more even sort of fading. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting that the rug we have at the front, the round one, which is called the rosy rug, which I designed with one of my daughter, that's faded quite a lot. But when yeah. people come in, they really, really like it. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, and you can see it gets a lot of strong sunlight there. That's why you also we put the films on the front of our shop because that protects a bit from uh, mm -hmm. the sunlight. Um, so, yeah, over time, in you can't really do anything but having said that because the people who do the micro sealing which is this new process i mentioned for protecting against stains they claim that it does help uh, against fading but it's relatively new as a commercial product they say that it, they've been using it for 10 years in the aviation industry but i don't know how much direct you probably get a lot of sunlight if you're sort of above the clouds in an airplane i don't know but um yeah I mean, even, you know, a sofa fabric will, yeah, will yeah, fade. Uh, the best thing to do is to treat the light by putting the films on, on the light, yeah. uh, on, on, you know, the window, so to speak, the light source. Okay. Yeah. What are the sort of lead times for getting things made? Yeah, lead times, um, when you're doing a tufted rod with a hand tool, uh, we usually quote uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Our weavers are supposed to do it in eight months, but they usually never do. Uh, and then you've also got to get it from Asia to here. And you know, there's always, that can always be a bit tricky as well. Um, this time of year is when the monsoon has started. So monsoon generally starts from around now until the beginning of September. And then in that period, you can't uh, dry the rugs on the on the rooftops as, uh, because of the weather conditions. And some weavers have chambers for dry, uh, drying, but it takes a bit longer, and all the logistics take longer. So then you would say um, more like uh, twelve to fourteen or twelve to sixteen weeks over the summer period. And then if it's a, a knotted rug, you have to calculate how long that will take, um, depending on how how long the rug is. So there's always the initial process, which is the same for not in the top. You've got to obtain the ball, you've got to the yarn, you've got to dye it, you've got to make it into balls, uh, you've got to plan it and all the graphs and things. And then you start the weaving. So the weaving is quicker when you're doing tufting because you're using a tool to do it. If you're doing the uh, knotting, then it's about 10 to 15 centimeters a day per person. And some rugs, like if you have a, a long, thin runner, you won't have, uh, say it's 
four meters long by 70 centimeters wide, you wouldn't have four people on the, uh, the length of it. You'd have one person doing all the meters because it would look, the knots, the lines of the knots would look wrong. So uh, you'd then work out, you know, your 15 centimeters a day, depending on how long the log is. And then you've then got the washing, the drying, the binding, you know, all the binding, like here you can see, you've got purple binding here, and purple area, orange and orange and so forth. So it's all quite intricate. And then it's carved by hand. And uh, so the, the washing, when it comes off the loom, you usually need two to three weeks to do that part. And before you get it on the loom, you need two to three weeks for that bit. And then the weaving, if it's tattered and it's relatively small, it can just take a week or 10 days. But if it's a big one and it's not, it can take months. And for very big pieces, they, they will build a loom. It's quite easy to build a loom. And they can also end up building a structure to, you know, to sit in, to, to make it, to, to weave it. And so the ones that we have made in Nepal, they, they're often made in the sort of mountain villages. And they, they do all the prep work, you know, the, they make the plan. The plan is the size of the rug on a huge like, potted paper. And then the, um, uh, they'll dye all the yarn and they'll make them a loom. And then the people will do it in their village. And they'll go out and they'll look after their kids, they'll grow their crops, and they'll go and do say weaving for two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. And they just sort of integrate it into their life like that. So, yeah, that's the, the story of rugs. You would never realize what goes into a rug, really. But there, there's a lot that goes into it, but there's also a lot to think about when you're uh, buying a rug. You can buy very cheap rugs that are, or less expensive rugs that are, um, you know, made in uh, by machines. You know, they literally uh, sort of huge machines, like printing machines, that just make the rugs. Um, and uh, but when you're when you're choosing something that's a beautiful handmade rug, it's important to consider all these different things that we've listed here because you want to get it right. And as I said at the beginning, a rug will can make totally change a room. So you want it to change the room for the better. You don't want it to be a big mistake. I mean, in fact, this uh, old lady who came to see us this week, she had ordered ninety square meters of rugs, which is a lot. And she doesn't like any of them. <laughs> so it's an expensive mistake. Um, yeah, and in, in fact, it's quite interesting because she had instructed her interior designer on what she wanted and she thought it would work. And if you sort of um, rationally think about, you know, well, she wanted very geometric, very like everything very ordered and geometric, and she chose a very geometric big hexagonal pattern but actually when you have a lot of that it's just too much and it's not relaxing it's sort of almost like an optical illusion like coming up towards you these big hexagonals mm -hmm. and uh she doesn't really like her home because the rugs have ruined it mm -hmm. all the rest is actually very nice but you know taking out the rugs will make a big difference and that's one of the things that we because we uh, we sell quite a bit in the UK, but we sell the same amount in the US and we sell a lot in other countries. People send us pictures of their rooms or their floor plans and we digitally place our rugs into them. And that's quite a good way of getting a feel of how something's going to look. Um, because unless you're quite experienced, and most, most clients are not experienced, but they often think they know what they want. But when they actually see it, it can be a bit of a shock. Um, I know for myself, in my first home, I bought myself a sofa, and when it came, I just realized it was the biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> it was a really nice sofa, but it just was too big for the room, and it was the wrong choice, but I had no experience. And you guys, that's what your job's going to be, is to tell people the right thing. But sometimes, because you're dealing with so many different things, like I said, at the end, the lighting, you know, the uh, what floor having, you know, furniture, the whole lot. You know, be guided by the experts you're working with. Uh, you know, what, and, and ask them you know, what to draw upon their knowledge to help you get the right thing. So will that client just work around or she's just going to 
No work around. And then as well, like, um, well, that's what on another question. Like, uh, do people ever come to you with like leftover remarks and can anything be done with it? You, know, you said that one that would only work if there's a certain size in that space. I found it was sort of like had like an arch window. If they were to build that rug and then move, is oh, there yeah. anything to be done with the leftover, like, or nothing you can't really do? Uh, well, with a, with a tufted rug, it's a bit easier because you can cut it and then you can rebind it. And people do do that. So if you've got a really huge rug, knotted one, I think you can, you can do that as well. It's a little more tricky because it's a bit like sewn that can kind of unravel. So you've got to really know what you're doing to do that. But just like, you know, I said at the beginning with the, you know, these palaces in the Middle East, people, they will specify a huge rug. It can't be transported, so it gets cut into pieces and it gets bound together again. So the same way you can cut them up and use them oh, in different yeah. ways. And, you know, there, there was a, a, a quite a fashion a few years ago for these kind of patchwork style rugs where people were taking really old rugs and they were bleaching them and sort of re dyeing them, but they cut them out and patchwork stitched them together. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can sort of recycle them in that kind of way. But a lot of people, I mean, my parents, they when they moved out a few times, they you know, took all their things with them. They even took their fitted carpet with them and had it refitted <laughs> as they got to smaller and smaller homes. They kind of reused the fitted carpet. And um, you know, all these things become part of your home, don't they? You know, some people like take their home from place to place, the same pictures, the same furniture, and what have you, and you just cut cut it down to yeah. make it fit. And other people, we have uh, quite a lot of clients who are in their they're sort of coming up to retirement and they've sort of left the family home and they just want to have, you know, they've usually got a, a really nice flat and they really want to have, uh, you know, be crazy and have exactly the one they want to start again from the, from the beginning, get rid of all the stuff they had for 30 years when they were bringing up the family and whatever and just have, have something different. So then ladies, if you call this rug, them. Well, she's going to decide if she's she doesn't really like them, and uh, if she's got the budget to change them, she'll change them. But you know that's the thing that they do totally change your room, so and it, it can be for the better, it can be for the worse. Yeah. <laughs> so getting it right is important. Yeah. And that's it's also. Well, I think she had a very specific idea of what she wanted. So she came to her designer and said, I want this. So the designer followed her instructions. And uh, I think, you know, it's sometimes it's quite tricky to what you're learning to do being interior designer because a client can come to you and tell you, I want this. And you can know that it won't look right. So then what do you do? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tricky one. I and mean, we've I've, I've had clients in here who've uh, come with their interior designers, and then the next time they come, they've sacked their interior designer and they've got another one, and then they've fallen out with that one. You don't quite know what, what's happened there, whether the interior designer is telling them, this is not going to look nice, don't do it. And if you do it, I'm leaving because I know you're not going to be happy. Yeah. Or, you know, it could be that, which is, you know, it's it's awkward yeah. because some people really you know they they really are sure that they know what they want but when they see it 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 is different and that's why I think you know all this visualization and pad and whatever is a is a very useful tool and I know that you you do that on your course don't you and it, it's really important I think yeah. that you you can't tell it you can't tell enough from a mood board really you need to see it visualized. So the old fashioned way is also really great when people are, you know, if you're sketching it, you get you can get a very good feel like that. Um, but uh, it really has a place to visualize things properly in 3D, however you choose to do it. Uh, because you know that's as close as you're gonna get to seeing the real thing. But I I mean for me, I feel that um, Pattern, you've got to be very careful with pattern. I don't tend to work with any pattern. All our designs are not repeated pattern. When you're dealing with patterns, they can, uh, you know, they can have a funny effect when you see too much of pattern. It's, it's, you know, if you've got a pattern in clothing, 
very different to have patterns like meters and meters and meters of pattern all around you. It's kind of give you a headache pattern. So, um, but if you have like a, uh, just in terms of having a plain drum, it's very plain. That's very, it's not very practical as well, because if you have a, unless it's a very dark color, which is often pulls down a room, room to have like big brown, dark carpet. But if you have, uh, you know, a, if you have a, like a cream carpet or rug everywhere, then you drop something on it, and it'll look dreadful really, really quickly. So when you have some pattern in it, it that does hide it. So this design, for example, is very practical because you don't really, you know, it's very detailed and you won't really notice if there's some dirt and marks on it. <laughs> you said it was before. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you. You'll put your details on our that we can feel we'll, Becca will send you this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you've got it and keep it as a reference point. And uh we also have for you are oh, those little boxes. So we have a little We'll send that to you on Friday. Oh, yeah, sure. so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 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 Uh, feel free, yeah. 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 So we, we've been working with Simon to uh, to do a, a competition with KLT, which is to give you guys opportunity to have a go at designing the rug. And uh, we just do, well, I think in the next couple of days, we'll yeah. have the actual um, the um, format of the competition. But we, we, um, the basis of it is we'll provide you with a room and also some. Um, Details of a fictional client, like their personality, their age group, their interests, you know, what, what their um, design, you know, their design vibe that they like. And then from that to design uh, a rug. That's the, that's the project. And we ask you to um, show us all your workings rather than just show the end rug. It's a bit like if I say to my kid with their maths homework. <laughs> You know, don't just give the end number because you may make a mistake. You know, the last process of the long sum, show all your workings all the way because you get marks. You know, you only get say 10% of the marks the right number at the end, but it's all the bits coming up to it. So, uh, then the winning design will be made, and uh, the winner will get a rug uh, for themselves. And then we will uh, add it to our collection. And uh, then when any rug is sold, you get a royalty uh, for the, the sale. It sounds pretty good, doesn't <laughs> it? Yeah. I did that with one of my daughters, and she's uh, she didn't think she'd sell any. She's actually sold quite a lot. So the other daughter's like, I want to do one now. <laughs> and I get, I get a sort of message from Australia. Regular basis. Have, have any Rosie rugs sold yet? Yes. <laughs> I need some money. <laughs> so um, it's a nice thing to do, and uh, this is just about last the presentation. <laughs> exactly. So um, and it's quite fun. So once the design is chosen, then uh, you would come and uh, work with us if you're still in the UK or whatever, and we can pick out the colours, and then it will be made. So it should be uh, quite a fun project. Should we specify like with this rug here? It's got like the different sort of levels and stuff like that. Would that be more something we might work out for you in person, like the, the height of the well, pile? Or would we you would just that? sort of say uh, on your design, sort of like low power, medium, mm -hmm. 
quite high, very high, or something like that. And then we will tell you what you know no, how many millimeters it should be and so forth. So it's you know the the, the just the essence of the design. And then when I, I do, I've done this with my daughter and uh, his brother, and we did one with her. Uh, you see, and if I get onto the um, the um right like this uh this rug we did in the wave rug uh this it's got a quite a lot of publicity. This shows operations. It's uh, it's it's quite tricky. This one in that we haven't sold as many the, the amount of publicity it's had. We haven't sold as many rugs as you might imagine because it's quite difficult to work with because you've got to be able to have that wave bit that comes out mm -hmm. coming in the right place. So if your arrangement is such that the wave needs to be somewhere else. You can't really mm -hmm. do that. So it makes it restricted. But this was quite fun because this was with uh, somebody, um, this lady called Jay Purple Brand, who's uh, in the States, in Brooklyn. It's, uh, she's an illustrator. Um, and she does various different things. When we first did this project, uh, oh, is it going to show me? So oh, I need, need help. But she, she, yeah, she's got uh, gets a, a lot of interest on there as well. Uh, Sure. Yes. I think like like it's just related to something and one of the things that you know how she feels quite visible at the moment. Yeah, she got a lot of she's got quite a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can just if you scroll down on the last page in the middle, it's then show more posts in the middle of her last post. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, very good technology. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there is, oh, now I have to go into, I have to do this. Uh, no, I think, I think maybe leave it. I'll leave it because yeah. I can't, I just got the wrong password on this. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you can see her uh, sitting on her rug. Uh, I don't know why she's just on her website as well, actually, down there. Uh, there should be a product page in here. Yeah, okay. it's shop. Maybe you just click. It's not very, oh, shop deck. Where shop 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 so yeah, I mean, you can be. Uh, well, I think am I allowed to say a bit more about the competition? Because we, we're going to. I think the person that we've chosen, Rebecca, you can say who the person we've chosen for. Yes. For the um, just. Oh, that's there her. There you go. <laughs> that was it. So she's. We'll come back again. No, just, just, just give us a very brief summary of the okay. the personality who would, is going to be personality to design for. Okay, so we have uh, some profiles, yeah, which we know is our type of clients, and from these profiles, we chose one that is from our core client, which is like the, the main top client, and her name is Susan. <laughs> Fictional, <laughs> Fictional. <Yeah. laughs> she doesn't exist. 
Uh, her name is Susan. She is 56 to 67-ish. So you, you know uh, more or less the, the age. Uh, she is an art shop owner and her community is very artistic. She loves art, she loves discovering new talents uh, and she loves vintage, but also she likes to mix vintage with the modern. So this is the, the kind of feeling she's single. She's happy about it, never been married. Peace <laughs> <laughs> of mind. <laughs> so this is our uh, profile for you. Uh, you're going to receive a little bit more information. You're gonna see a face, so you can associate Susan with, you know, uh, with her face, and then you're going to design something for her. Well, we'll, well, we'll provide you the room. Yeah, we're gonna give you a room, which we think will be the type of room Susan may have, and then the the task is to design a rug to go with. So that will she... make Susan happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and I think the timing is gonna be. Like the design should be submitted by the beginning of October or end of September around that time. And then it will be, uh, the winner will be announced at the beginning of November. And then uh, it will probably take about a month to actually specify the rug. And then it will take, then it should be ready in something like February, March. And it will be open to all students at KLC, not just the schools, isn't it? Right? We, we, um, we are. I think Ruth was uh, has got a couple of couple of other uh, cohorts in mind, particularly yeah. the, the super okay. that's right about placement yeah. for them. So yeah, it will be something. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. to yeah. show us all all your kind of thoughts, and I think you've put in there as well to sort of like write a one pager about why you've chosen this design and what you know what's influenced you or what what you want to bring to the room or you know uh, just the thinking behind the design. That's all sounds pretty really fantastic. So thank you very much, Sonia. <laughs> so yeah, so that's kind of it.